Hello again. Um, I'm ready to present to you chapter 17, which is the chapter on European and American art basically in the 18th century. So um, here we go. Here's a map. There are several big ideas in the 18th century. Among them is industrial revolution, which was happening uh, in Europe all over Europe, and the Enlightenment, and I'm going to try to communicate the Enlightenment to you. The chances are very good that you are somewhat familiar with Industrial Revolution from your education, um, but you may not know very much about the Enlightenment. So one of the big ideas of the Enlightenment is <clears throat> that all white men deserved equal rights and opportunities. I know that's not how they said it at the time, but that's what they meant. Um, and just think for a moment, if you can, um, and imagine what happened at the end of the 18th century. So some very, very big events occurred at the end of the 18th century. That's the 1700s. So I'll tell you about them as we move through this, but um, I'm just trying to anchor this in stuff that you will probably already know. So the exuberant Baroque style that we saw in the 17th century evolved into two main styles of art. Uh, the Rococo is the first style that we're going to look at. So here's a, a nice text slide. Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah, and there's something important down at the bottom. This is a reverential attitude towards scientific inquiry. Uh, so keep that in mind. This is an age of revolution and radical change in society, thought, and politics with worldwide consequence. So Rococo, the term combines the Italian word barocco, possibly the source of Baroque, and the French word rocaille, a form of decoration using shells and pebbles. Stylistically, it was refined and fanciful, a reaction against the grand manner of Baroque art. So it's much lighter. It's not nearly as serious as you will see very soon. So we're going to first examine the Rococo. I want you to get a good taste for it. Then we will leave it behind, although you might see some little traces later on. So um, we're going to start with some architecture and a, a space designed by the Germain Beaufranc, the Salon de la Princesse in the Hotel de Soubise combines gold across expanses of white and pastels, mirror reflections, delicate ornament in stucco and boisseries, carved wood panels. Uh, pictorial themes were taken from classical love stories. So right there, the themes, the subjects have absolutely nothing to do with this religious furor that swept through Europe in the 17th century. So here's uh, an interior, that interior that I just described. So just notice how very decorative it is. Also that it is a room without square corners. The, well, the only square corner I ever see is where the wall meets the floor, but where the, the wall meets the ceiling or the there's no corners to this room. So it's all like being sort of inside of a large bubble. Um, and then you can see that there are these odd shaped um, canvases stuck in the corner, lots of gilt wood, mirrors, and uh, putti fluttering around the ceiling. Um, nothing. It's just delightful. It should be just visually delightful, and it was visually delightful for the people who lived at that time. So here is a Rococo church. So you get several of these that were um, created, especially in Catholic countries, and I'm not going to go down that um, at the moment, why that why their taste runs to the Rococo, but it does. So this is a church. I showed you this earlier when I was showing you a contrast between Protestant and Catholic church interiors. So this is highly decorated. Um, the colors are so light now. Like there's lots of white and pastel colors. There's lots of putti. I've never done a, a, a census to see how many putti are in this space, but there are lots. And there's a little island down here with several statues of saints. So that's another thing that tips you off that this is a Roman Catholic is because of the veneration of saints, which continues. Um, so there you go. And um, then at the, at the 
end of this continuum of decoration, we get to this little church. This is bonus feature, but it's um, one of my favorites, so I always have to show this to my students. It's um, designed by a couple of brothers called the Assam Brothers, and it's a little church, St. Johann Nepomuk in Munich, Germany. On the left is a picture of the facade of the church, and you can see it's just sort of squished in between some other buildings. It's a very urban setting church, and it's also very tiny. So this is um, on the right, um, I swear, I don't see any wall space. Everything is decorated. It's like a pooty bomb has exploded in here. And there's images of saints, there's pooty, there's gold, there's frou-frou everywhere. Now look up above the altar. This is looking towards the altar. And you can see this window, um, this golden window that should remind you of this um, display at the altar of St. Peter's in Rome that I showed you in the Baroque period that was designed by Bernini. So here's uh, this same effect created in a church in Germany uh, for the same purpose, to inspire awe in the people worshiping there, to make them feel like God is present. Um, it's a very small church, as I said. So here's a photograph taken with a fisheye lens from the back of the church showing you just how small it is. So it's it the pews, there's only one pew, and it seems to have a space for five or six people going across it. That's it. It's a really, really small, but extremely decorated. And here you can see some more of these figures stuck around the edge. So um, I also encourage my students, if you ever get to Munich, try to find this church because it is it's something you won't forget. Now we're going to look at um, a little Rococo painting, not much, and there was tons of it made because this was the style, this is the taste that appealed to the nobility in France and in Germany. Uh, so the Germans and the French loved it. Um, so the subject here uh, is just romance. It's called The Pilgrimage to Cythera, and this was an imaginary... Uh, journey that couples took, loving couples, and they would get on a boat, and this is, like I said, it's imaginary, so they would board the boat and go to an island called Cythera, which was dedicated to Venus, also known as Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Over on this side, there's a herm, which is like a column-type statue. It's not a full figure, but it's just sort of the top half of her body, um, so that indicates that it's that this is her island and the lovers have brought offerings of flowers to the goddess of love um, they've come off of the boat there you can see part of the ship here and there's little pooty fluttering around in the air because the pooty are so happy that the lovers are loving they're all coming out they're just you know to celebrate their relationships i guess i don't know so this is <laughs> Sorry, this is Rococo. Now look at the style of the painting. Look at the trees. Um, there's nothing about this which smacks of naturalism or realism. Everything is fanciful. It's like it's in a, a dream world where trees are fluffy feathers and, and pooty are fluttering around in the air. It's just uh, very Rococo. So I will show you some more Rococo, um, a painting by Fragonard, a follower of Watteau, the guy we just saw. He created a lush painting called The Swing in 1767. A pretty young woman on a swing lifts her leg and gives an unobstructed view up her skirt to her lover, who is hidden in the bushes below. The statue of Cupid with a shushing gesture maintains a humorous yet risque atmosphere. So this is this notorious painting. And again, uh, before we dig in, I mean, you just read about the subject, but look at the style. It is like a fanciful, non-real world where the trees are just like fluffy, imaginable, uh, imaginary trees. My favorite bit here is the skirt of the woman because it it just seems to be weightless. It's fluttering around her. She kicks her delicate little foot up 
a slipper flies off, which is very suggestive for uh, yielding, yielding to her lover who is down on the ground. Um, it's quite possible that the man behind her who is pulling the swing, he's got a rope attached to it, and he's making it go up and down, could be her husband. So this could be um, illustrating a an affair between this woman and her lover. And again, this subject, this style, this is what the king of France, his mistresses, uh, his lovers, his friends, this is what they would put in their country homes and, and enjoy looking at. Very lighthearted, nothing heavy, no moral message at all, and no religion whatsoever. So now we're done with Rococo. So you get the sense. And I, like I said, there were tons of these that were made. Um, but we're just going to move on now and, and look at some more serious stuff. So um, where I don't like to talk about the Enlightenment when we have a, a, a text slide up. But um, so let's read this text and then I'll move you to a picture. So we're going to go to England next. And members of the English middle class fueled a market for paintings portraying satires, genre scenes, or moral scenes from history and literature. They were not as interested in high-minded tales from mythology, the Bible, or classical literature. So the English taste tends to go to sort of mocking the people in power or um, sort of more of a humorous, often subject, but we'll also see some serious subjects as well. So uh, now before I discuss this, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Enlightenment because this approach does come from the Enlightenment. Uh, the Enlightenment sprang from the ancient philosophies but took an air of optimism. Um, among the thoughts of the people sort of pushing the Enlightenment were that mankind was uniquely gifted. Mankind could solve social and political problems without divine intervention, meaning that um, without God, without appealing to God to fix the world, you could do it yourself. Um, and mankind could perfect the world. This is the root of utopianism. The philosophers rewrote the chief end of man. Uh, and earlier, the chief end of man was believed to be to glorify God and enjoy that relationship forever. But now the chief end of man is no longer relating to God. Uh, humanity and nature were seen as basically good. So no original sin that um, there's this idea of the noble savage, of uh, people being pure from your birth and only later spoiled by civilization or, or taken down a, a road of making bad choices. They also believed in reason over emotion, the rules of law, and civilization. They were very optimistic. They believed humanity could be reformed if not perfected, and that art could help achieve that perfection. So um, working towards perfection using your own uh, imagination, your own skills, and your own determination. Voltaire, who is a French philosopher, encouraged scientific fact-based study. So this is also the time when science becomes a, a field of study and scientific method begins. Um, the Enlightenment ideals led to new interest in democracy and responsible citizenship and sort of the end of these despotic monarchs who were ruling Europe and determining the fate of all their people. Uh, it spurred a look backward at the Greek culture and gave us democracy, and to Rome, uh, the great and more convenient repository of classicism, because it was so close to continental Europe. Classic virtues en encouraged were patriotism, stoicism, self-sacrifice, and frugality. Yeah, and what I just showed you from the Rococo period does not reflect this at all. Um, so that's why... You know, it's kind of an aberration. It's just an indulgence. So let's look at this painting now. William Hogarth, the English artist. This is our first time that we're seeing an actual English artist. During the reign of Henry VIII, the artists that were recording the, the 
English court were coming from continental Europe, but now we have an actual Englishman. And he did a series of satirical pieces. Um, this is from a series called Marriage a la Mode. Um, and there were a series of paintings which were then turned into prints and mass produced and sold cheaply to the middle class. Um, I don't know who would have bought the original painting, That's, but now it's in the National Gallery of London. Um, so he did several series. We're just going to look at this one, but he also did a series uh, called The Rake's Progress, which was about a young man who continually made bad choices and ended up, you know, I think probably dying of, of a STD or something. And then he did another series called The, um, the, Harlot, the Harlot's Progress, I think. Um, about a young woman who makes bad choices, and you can imagine where her choices uh, take her. But we're going to look at something that's a little more humorous and not nearly as scary, and this is the marriage contract. So in this painting, you've got two fathers who are negotiating a marriage between their children. Uh, the children being married are over here. The, the young man, Lord, the young Lord Squanderfield, and his... Uh, his soon-to-be wife, this uh, woman. Here are the fathers over here. So the man in the red coat is the father of the woman, the bride, and this man sitting down um, pointing to his family tree on a scroll is the elder Lord Squanderfield. Um, so what you have here is a marriage of convenience. The Squanderfields have absolutely squandered all of their wealth that they had for probably centuries, um, and so they're broke. And the lady's father has made a fortune in some industry. So this is the Industrial Revolution. It reverses a lot of the course of society. So he's made money. He's nouveau riche, and this is old money over here. New money, old money. Um, the Lord Squanderfield is pointing to his family tree to say, look, we... We come from this noble medieval knight, and there's a knight down at the bottom with this big tree or root growing out of his stomach. That's the family tree showing how noble they are. They've got the name and everything. But uh, as typical with people who live high on the hog, he's got a bad case of gout, uh, which is a very painful condition of the legs and feet. So he's got his uh, right foot bandage <laughs> elevated. I mean, all of this was, of course, to amuse the people who saw it, and they would point to all the details and laugh hysterically. Oh, those rich people. Yeah, they're not so well off anymore. Um, so anyway, and on the in the background on the walls are all these uh, these funny paintings, and this one is like a Medusa looking down horrified at what's going on here. Uh, outside, um, and here's a planner. He's holding up an architectural design. So Lord Squanderfield, even though he has no money, he's making plans now because there soon will be money and he's going to enlarge his estate out there. Um, but let's see what happens. So anyway, uh, Hogarth, uh, like I said, he did a series of paintings and then they were reproduced in print form. So here's one of the prints that was made from this and mass produced and circulated. Of course, people loved it. And I just pointed out some of the things that they enjoyed laughing about. So this was not art that was put on the wall to inspire you or to lead you to a holy life. This was art that was just for your pure enjoyment, for humor. Um, and at the end of the series, this is, I believe this is the final painting from Marriage a la Mode, and it shows the young Squanderfields um, after their marriage and, and uh, things have gone from bad to worse. The young Lord Squanderfield has been out all night drinking. This is a morning scene, by the way. Um, he's been out all night gambling, drinking, womanizing. The dog over here has found a pair of ladies' panties, or maybe it's a handkerchief, in his pocket. Um, so as, as proof, as evidence that he has been unfaithful. Uh, the lady, the young lady Squanderfield, 
uh, has recently been having a music lesson because we have a, a musical instrument and a book of music on the floor. Uh, I don't know what's going on there. There may have been something improper, but there's her music teacher. And this is their uh, bookkeeper, their accountant, who has on his spike here a whole bunch of bills. So apparently um, the young Lord Squanderfield is out spending money and it may all be gone. And we've got more uh, uh, commentaries from the artwork on the wall. So um, I hope you enjoyed this. This is William Hogarth. Um, so that same tendency of finding fault and wanting to correct things that are wrong in society, because that's really what that's all about. It's not just simply laughing at them, but it's saying, yeah, this is, this is not good. We can do better. Um, also leads to a reform movement in England of, uh, abolitionists. So in the 18th century, you get a very, um, strong and vociferous, that means very vocal group of, abolitionists who come from the Church of England and they are and the Methodist Church as well and they are interested in or they're driven to end slavery and so that's what the abolitionists are working on very early on and this artist William Hackwood who worked for Wedgwood who um, was a ceramics manufacturer he had large factories making dishes and pottery and things. Um, he, he designed this medallion um, to give to the people, the, the people who were working actively to end slavery. And it shows an enslaved or a chained African man on his knee uh, with the motto, the inscription, am I not a man and a brother? Um, and when I was at Colonial Williamsburg a couple of years ago, I saw a display. I had um, encountered the, the picture I just showed you in the textbook, of course, and then I saw this display about the abolitionists in the United States or the colonies, colonial America, and um, I saw this same kneeling uh, figure on this mug here, and then some more medallions. I did some research and found that they were um, very common. Um, common currency in this time when this social movement is trying to get its uh, trying to eradicate slavery. So the inscription on the back said, "Whatever ye would that men should do to you, do you even so to them?" And that just means it's just an old-fashioned way of saying, uh, "Do unto others as you would have them do unto you." So there we go, abolition. Here's another big idea that the English liked. They were very interested in scientific method and in science and in figuring out how the world worked. Um, and so science itself becomes a popular subject for some artists. And this artist, Joseph Wright of Darby, um, he, he did a lot of paintings, a lot of portraits, but he's best known for his science paintings. And so look at this, look at this uh, gorgeous representation of a group of people gathered around a scientist who is performing an experiment on a bird, so creating a vacuum and the bird, um, the bird collapses, it stops breathing. So um, I hope you also sense that this is uh, reflecting the influence of Caravaggio, that you have a very dark scene and the figures in it are illuminated dramatically from a single light source, so it's not universally illuminated. Um, we can't tell a whole lot about the setting, which is also very uh, Caravaggio-esque. And the style of painting is extremely naturalistic. So just look at this woman's face over here on the left. For an example, I think that she looks practically photographic. It's just amazing. So um, this is this is a style. This, he's highly polished, a completely different style from Hogarth, but I, um, I hope you like it. And so I have another one. Um, oh, let me find it, what I have here. Yeah, this is the orrery here. Um, and this is a philosopher giving a lecture at the orrery. So in my mind, because these two paintings show uh, one 
man who is the scientist, who's the authority, and then you have a group of people that include children gathered around him. Um, I just sort of imagine that it becomes a popular after-dinner entertainment that families might invite a scientist over to show them something and uh, it would be like they would have a dinner party and then after dinner instead of having music or playing cards or whatever they would say let's go have an experiment and the scientist would then um, do his thing because you see children fascinated so the orrery here is a model of the solar system and this was the latest astronomical uh, science and they would have i'm assuming models of the planets would would move around these brass rings and explain how the universe was ordered also very new uh, new ideas so now um, another big movement here, and this one is going to really dominate the 18th century, and this is uh, neoclassicism. Uh, we'll see a little bit more of it later, but for right now, um, just a sort of a foretaste here, because this represents another one of the big ideas of the Enlightenment, and that is uh, this strong moral message that uh, says, you are capable of making choices that are really good, not just selfish choices. Um, so this artist is Angelica Kaufmann. She was, uh, I believe she's German, and she was painting in England. Um, so the subject here is from the ancient Rome. And if you look at her, she's dressed the way an 18th century European person imagined a Roman woman to dress and you can tell it's kind of classical because of the the setting um, we've got some heavy stone columns nothing decorative nothing that that screams it's in England or anything contemporary so she's making an attempt for that now the subject here um, is what's of interest I think so uh, this is Cornelia, and this is her home, and these are her children. So uh, this woman in red that's seated here um, apparently has some new bauble, some new piece of jewelry that her husband bought for her, and she came over to visit Cornelia and show it off. So she comes over and she says, look at this, this gorgeous um, golden chain that my husband bought. Uh, isn't it lovely? Um Cornelia, where are your treasures? In other words, she wants to see what jewelry Cornelia has. So Cornelia gestures to her children. And she says, these are my treasures. So right here, it's like saying children and family are more important than jewelry or material possessions. And shame on the woman in red for thinking otherwise. Uh, because this is what a good human being does. They value relationships. Um, and Cornelia happens to be the mother of a future Caesar. So these children are not just ordinary children, but they're children who will have a place in history. Uh, sorry, I can't give you the details because I'm not real sure uh, which they're. Oh, sorry, Tiberius and, and Gaius Gracchus. Yeah, I had a note on that. Um, this is also what is called the exemplum virtutis, or an example of virtue, and it becomes a popular subject. It's popular also in France, uh, the same place where they like Rococo. They might also want something that reminds them how good they could be. Um, I have some interesting paintings. None of these will show up on, on the quiz, but it's just, you know, they were in the textbook. So what the heck? So here's Thomas Gainsborough, another English artist who did many, many portraits of the aristocracy, the English people who had enough money to pay him. And this is an English couple sitting out um, on their land looking like, oh, they're so in love with each other, aren't they? Um, and here's just a reminder, a similar subject from the Dutch couple that I showed you earlier, the Franz Hals portrait of the couple sitting out under a tree. So the subject is very similar, but the 
the character of the sitters is way different. And then speaking of couples, here's an American couple. So our first real American artist, John Singleton Copley. Um, I believe Copley went to England to learn how to be an artist. Um, he's America's first old master. Thomas Mifflin and Sarah Morris dignified the figures while recording their features accurately. There you go, Americans. Now let's go back to France. So um, look at some more portraits here. So um, this is a portrait. This is our artist down here, a woman artist, uh, uh, Marie-Louise Elisabeth of Viger la Brune. And she is doing this official portrait of Marie Antoinette. And just think of what you know about Marie Antoinette, and I'm sure this fits right with it. That's, that's sarcasm. Uh, here's Marie <laughs> posing with her children. Um, and the idea here is that Marie is wanting to see an image of herself as a doting, perfect mother, even though it's probably very far from the truth that she ever even spent time with her children. She wants to think of herself as that, and she wants to promote that image. So um, here she is with a little baby on her lap and two other children and one of the children is gesturing to a crib that is empty and it is draped in black. So that shows you that uh, a child has died and so Marie is not immune to sadness as, as I'm sure all humans are that there has been um, the visit of the Grim Reaper in her life and she's lost a baby. Um, this is uh, Marie Antoinette's husband. This is Louis the Sixteenth. So we'll see him and hear a little bit more about him later. So um, the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture began to exhibit members' recent work in salons starting in 1737, and these women were not allowed. Uh, Vigée Le Brun was not allowed in the academy, uh, nor was Adelaide La Bougiard, but she wanted to be, and this is the painting that she created as her application piece, like uh, to prove to the Academy of Painting that she was indeed very competent and deserved to be treated on equal footing with the men. Um, so uh, his, this is her self-portrait. So she is the one sitting down there, and she has two pupils, two other women standing behind her, uh, watching her paint as she instructs them. And, but what she's doing is probably gazing into a mirror and painting what she sees, herself and her students. So um, I just wanted to show you a detail so you could see how very talented she was. Just look at the texture of the silk of her dress. So she gets so many textures here. She has the silk, lace, skin, hair, uh, very frizzy hair, a straw hat, velvet cushion, carved wood. It's And look at this very uh, transparent um, light tulle fabric back behind her. So this is her show-off piece saying, I'm a painter, I'm a great painter, let me in. I, I do believe she made it in to, to the uh, academy. So neoclassicism, this is what we had a hint at before with, um, with Angelica Kaufman. Neoclassicism is defined by heroic nudity, classical orders, and a general emphasis on noble and serious modes of expression. In addition to Italy's wealth of antique ruins, the city of Pompeii was discovered in 1748, creating great interest across Europe. That will be a quiz question, by the way. Um, you need to know that Pompeii had been buried Nobody even knew it was there until 1748 when um, it was dug out, began to be dug out. So that's what we're going to continue with in part two. This is the end of part one. So uh, stay tuned for the next part and you'll see some more neoclassicism and some revolution.